Hey there, veterans. This is Justin with a quick note before today's episode. There are a ton of resources out there for veterans, and I'm learning about more of them each and every day. That's why I've added a directory on my website to help you find the resources that are right for you. If you go to beyondtheuniform.io slash directory, you can see these resources and you can add to them. Hope this helps and enjoy the show. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today is episode number 55 with Ashley Snyder. Even getting my foot in the door at Google, once I was in Google, I had so many doors open. I was able to network, meet other veterans, actually, learn about what they're doing. And that's why after that one year, I was in a role that I liked, but it wasn't the perfect match. I was able to get in a role, which is the role I have now, which I really like. I feel like it's a great match, and I can actually see myself doing for the next, like, five years. Top three reasons to listen to today's episode are, one, career path. Ashley was unexpectedly medically discharged from the Air Force and had just 30 days to make her transition. And amidst this craziness, she managed her transition directly to Google from the Air Force. She has great advice on managing the transition process and also provides great thoughts about considering an MBA from a cost-benefit analysis perspective. Two operations. Ashley is in operations at Google and provides thoughts on why operations is well-suited for veterans, an overview of operations career paths, and what it takes to be successful. Three cultural differences. I loved Ashley's comparison of how Google's culture compares to the military. For those of you interested in high-tech or internet companies, you'll find this really fascinating. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find other great episodes and resources. There, you'll also find show notes for each episode. Ashley mentions quite a few resources for veterans, and I've included links to each of these in the show notes for this episode. So let's dive in to my interview with Ashley Snyder. Well, joining me today in Mountain View, California, is Ashley Snyder. Ashley, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thank you so much. Super excited to talk with you guys. Well, for listeners, I wanted to give a quick background on Ashley. She's the Global Process Manager of Finance Operations at Google. She started out at the Air Force Academy, where she studied operations research and was a distinguished grad. After the Air Force Academy, she went to MIT, where she earned her master's in operations research, while also serving at Draper Laboratories as an operations research analyst. She then served five years in the Air Force in a variety of capacities as part of the Medical Services Corps, including positions as a manager of TRICARE operations, budget manpower and resources program manager, a business plan consultant working directly for the hospital's executive group, and eventually the executive assistant for Pacific Air Force's Surgeon General. Uh, She went directly from the Air Force to Google, starting out as an operations manager in the global sales operations group. Um, So, Ashley, to start start out, um, how would you explain to someone on active duty what you do at Google? Um, Well, I recently changed roles uh, from the operations manager position to the global process manager. And basically what I do on a day-to-day basis is I manage a team of vendors, which is great because it is made at interaction with people that I had in the Air Force that I kind of missed. Um, and uh, we have, I work through a, a set of processes to help our vendors execute our tasks. So I work in collections. Our processes all have to do with collecting money from our clients and customers from Google and how we could turn kind of our accounts receivable into actual, actual revenue that goes into the bottom line of our balance sheet. And, and what does that look like? I always like to paint the picture of a day in your life. So if you were to have like a typical day, what, what time do you start? What sort of activities do you do? Paint that picture of what life is like. So one of my favorite things about Google is the flexibility. I'm actually working from um, outside of my office location for this week. Uh, and that's really awesome. And then um, despite being a global team, I'll still work normal hours. I start around... 8.30, 9 o'clock, and finish around 5.36, which is a very pleasant change to my 0700 start to hit in the military. Um, and basically, uh, come to work, uh, think with my vendors that are located in Poland and the Philippines and Dublin, make sure kind of everything's been going good since they've been working while I was asleep, and then uh, usually handle a couple of fires from our sales team that are upset that their client is unhappy and 
trying to kind of mend those relationships so that we can still uh, get paid and work through our day-to-day tasks. And then usually a handful of meetings. And then some of the things you need to Google are um, all of our food is free. So uh, part of my day is picking which cafe I'm going to go eat at because there's <laughs> such a variety. And it's a really fun part of the day for all of us. That's awesome. The, the tough decisions in life. It is. It is. Um, and, and you started out at operations manage, as an operations manager at Google. What did that job look like when you first started? So this is very interesting and something I definitely like to share with folks listening to this. Uh, my last role in the Air Force was as an executive officer, which in the Air Force is kind of a glorified secretary slash admin slash chief of staff type role. So that was the top role on my resume. And that got me into a position at Google that was very similar to that uh, role I had in the Air Force. This operations manager role turned into kind of a glorified admin type role where I did a lot of event planning and um, agenda management. And it wasn't actually what I was looking for, but um, which, is, which is actually why I just changed roles into finance. But it was, it, it, it's interesting because I guess that, since that was the last role that I had on my resume, that was the first one everyone saw. And when they, when they saw that, they're like, oh, this girl would be a great match for something. But the reality is that's not what I do. I'm more of an analyst. I'm more of an optimizer, a process improver. And if I could do that all over, I might even take that portion off of my resume or have made it really, really small so that it wasn't the first thing people saw. Because I would say that job, although a great segue into Google and a great opportunity, was not where I saw myself after I got uh, kind of assimilated to the role. That's, that's great. I hadn't thought about that before, but kind of the recency effect that the, the last thing right. that they saw you do is probably they're assuming that your trajectory is headed in that direction. And so really making exactly. sure that the story is in the direction that the, the, the person wants to go. That's precisely right. Like this role in the Air Force was one of those like special project type roles that I was doing because it would quote unquote be good for my career. It would get me a really high rating. Um, But in the long term, it wasn't really something that was going to advance me outside of the military. Um, And the first role Google actually talked to me about was an administrative business partner, which is basically a secretary. And after I talked to them about that role, about my background, about MIT, operations research, and what I had actually done, the lady I talked to, the recruiter I talked to was like, wow, uh, I think we've mismatched you. Let me get back to the drawing boards and come back to you. So I would say what you said is very, uh, very important. It's, it's that's, it that's great, though, because it sounds like it got your foot in the door. And then, you know, I, I imagine that first hurdle is one of the most difficult to get past of just getting a conversation. But then you got your foot in the door and then were able to kind of redirect to something more aligned with your interests. Exactly. I was able to kind of sell myself and focus on the parts of my resume that I really wanted to uh, kind of show off. And then furthermore... Even getting my foot in the door at Google, once I was in Google, I had so many doors open. I was able to network, meet other veterans, actually, learn about what they're doing. And that's why after that one year, I was in a role that I liked. But it wasn't a perfect match. I was able to get in a role, which is the role I have now, which I really like. I feel like it's a great match, and I can actually see myself doing for the next, like, five years. And, and let's, let's maybe back, um, back up because I'd love to hear the story of how you got there. So let's, let's go back to when you were in the Air Force. At what point did you know you were going to transition out of the Air Force, and how did you approach that decision? Sure. So um, that decision was sort of made for me. I was part of a medical evaluation board and was medically discharged from the Air Force, which is very stressful if anyone's going through it because you don't know – when they're going to come back with your results. And when, as soon as they come back with your results, they're like, you have 30 days to leave. So when you're looking for roles, it's really hard to tell future employers, like, well, it could be one month or it could be four months. Do uh, you still want to hire me? Um, so that was something that was super, super stressful. But I still, you know, was working through the process, and I actually got synced up with a Naval Academy grad who um, has a recruiting company. It's called NUPOC, N-U-P-A-C-C, and it's predominantly for Navy and Nuclear Submarines. But he reaches out to other services and other positions as well. And he had a um, like a, a happy hour and um, social event in Hawaii that I was able to attend 
um, get synced up with, with great companies. Google was there. Palantir was there. Facebook was there. Um, there were great grad schools. I think Stanford and Wharton were both there, including um, even like if I wanted to go to med school, they had a med school rep. Um, so it was a really awesome way for me to kind of network, show them, have my resume, have those initial conversations. And from there, uh, each one of those companies either came back or and said, hey, you know, we want to push you through the interview process. Or like, thanks so much for interviewing. Like, you didn't quite pass it. But all of that was, like, wonderful experience. You know, you don't know how bad you are interviewing until you start doing it and you're like, oh, my God, I just blacked out. What did I say for the last 10 minutes? <laughs> so you really start to understand where your weaknesses are, where you could probably better explain something in your resume, and you kind of get to do that in a safe environment, which I really like. That's great. And so, um, and, and, and that sounds like it helped you kind of with, with resume and interview and an exposure. And is that how you, did you say you didn't go to Google from there or how did you actually get your, yeah. You know? So from that, um, event, the new pocket event, um, a Google rep and I chatted, she liked my resume and the rest kind of went through the history. It was she sent it through some recruiters. A couple of recruiters called me to talk about positions. When I finally settled into a role that I was actually going to interview for, I had a couple um, face-to-face uh, interviews, a couple phone call interviews, and eventually, you know, was given an offer. So it was all from that uh, nuclear submarine event in Hawaii. Wow. And um, I'm, I'm curious, before you went to that NUPOC event, did you have any indication that you wanted to go into technology or you wanted to go to the Bay Area or, or were you approaching this kind of open slate and, and through the process fell in love with this? I would say I was scared to make that decision. I didn't really know what to do, how to do it. Um, I kind of started down the Bradley Morris route, but I wasn't really loving the salaries or the positions that they were offering me. But at the same time, it felt very safe because it was all but like a guaranteed opportunity. Um, but once I started working with Google, I got really excited about Google. And I even said, if I don't get this job, I'm going to push, push, push and try to get into Google in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley because it, there, there's just so many companies in that area. And it's not Google then one of the like thousand other great companies Um that have the same culture, the same, you know, opportunities, just a different name on top of them. So basically after interviewing with Google is when I, I got really hooked on Silicon Valley and tech companies and, you know, kind of getting my foot in the door in that area. That's great. I mean, it sounds like one of the best resources you had was this new POC recruiting event where you were able to get rapid exposure to a lot of different opportunities and possibilities. Yeah. And that really so that started was- to inform you. You know, it was really important because it was better than just, like, putting my name, going to, like, Google careers and putting my resume in and hoping that somebody saw it out of the millions of resumes they saw. This event and events like it, whether it be, like, Service Academy, Conference, all of those actually are great ways for you to talk to somebody, to to talk to a recruiter face-to-face and skip that whole, like, email screening or massive spamming that I think otherwise you might have had. And on that note, um, if you know somebody working at a company, getting a referral is the easiest way to get hooked up with a recruiter. So if it means spamming your LinkedIn network and finding somebody that works with the company you want to work, or reaching out to just a a grad from the school you went to, finding somebody who's willing to have like a 30-minute conversation with you and put your name in as, as a referral really, really helps trim the fat of, what could be kind of a, well, I hope someone sees my resume type of process. That's awesome. And um, I'm wondering, what what was the application process itself like? And in particular, what advice would you have for other veterans who are applying to Google? A- apart from like the, would, the referral that you said. Sure. There's a great book called PCS to Corporate America. It was where I learned I was a bad interviewer because I would try to answer some of the interview questions in that book. And like I said, I would like black out and be like, what did I talk about? But I was able to work through those kind of behavioral types of interview questions and really understand how to stay focused and how to tell them exactly what they wanted to hear, how to alter my responses to really focus on the strengths that the job was looking for. 
And, um, and on that note, um, getting buzzwords. Like in the military, we might say, you know, worked across multiple services or something. But in the civilian world, that's like cross-functional relationships. And maybe I was a flight commander in the military or a company commander. But in the, in the civilian force, like, I want to change that wording to be, like, program manager, process manager, um, operations manager. I want to really change my resume so that when a recruiter reads it, they say, oh, program manager. Yeah, we have a ton of those at our company. Now I see where this person would, would fit versus being like, oh, I was the um, resource management flight commander. And somebody was like, oh, flight. I thought I didn't know this person was a pilot, you know. So if you can do yourself any favor, it's to really, like, put the, the jargon from the, the company or the area you're trying to work and apply that to your resume so that um, it, it really, I don't know, speaks to them a little bit differently than, than, than your resume would. Like an executive officer, that doesn't really mean anything to anyone at Google or, like I said, a flight commander, but I was able to kind of tweak those um, to, to speak their language, and I think that helped a lot. What other uh, resources would you recommend? You mentioned PCS to Corporate America. Were there any other books or websites or, or anything else that you would recommend to another veteran to check out? I think the biggest thing is to talk to people who have recently gone through the process. Um, that PCS to Corporate America book was a great starting point. The other thing was having talked to um, friends that have recently transitioned and asking them what the process was like. One of the things that I learned um, and that my expectations were not entirely managed is when I talked to the first person I talked to at Google, I thought that that was an interview. And when she's like, we're really interested, we're going to move on to the next part, I was like, oh, my God, I nailed my interview. But the reality is, is like I had had basically a personal personality test with a recruiter who was like, is this person weird? Do I think they'll fit into the culture? Okay, binary, yes, no. Now I'll move them on to the next part, which is, which was like – a single conversation with the hiring manager just to make sure that technically I would be um, adept. Like my personality fit, now will my skills fit? And they're like, okay, we want to move on to the next thing. And I'm like, bam, two interviews down. I've got to be close. But the reality was I hadn't actually interviewed at that point. After that, they're like, okay, we want to bring you to Google for a face-to-face -face interview to do four um, different interviews with, you know, each of these people. And I was like, whoa okay, wow, that's the real interview. I don't know what I just did, but this is the real, real interview. And if I would have talked to some other veterans about, like, the process, about the screening process, I think I would have kind of had my, my expectations a little more managed and not felt like I, I never knew what the end was. Was it another interview? Was it another phone call? Like, when do I just find out? Um, so I would say people are probably a, a great resource. And... Um... I was also curious, I, I just think it's very impressive that you went directly from the Air Force to Google. I'm wondering if you had thought of trying to get another advanced degree as kind of a buffer after the military, or any advice you'd have to veterans about considering grad school versus going directly into industry? Sure, that's a great point. Um, I actually still have this conversation with my manager because I don't have an MBA and many of the people I work with have MBAs. So I'm like, oh, should I go back and get an MBA or, you know, I have the GI bill, am I not utilizing it? Um, and the biggest thing is if you're able to get the role that you would have gotten with an MBA. So for example, I work with people with MBAs. I don't have an MBA. If I were to leave Google put myself two years behind my peers to get an MBA, would I come back to the same role? Probably. So maybe for me, an MBA isn't the best thing. But maybe in three, four, five, six, seven years, I do an executive MBA because that will be more applicable to me and it will still help me get that, like, uh, box check. Um, otherwise, I think it just depends. There's certain roles that require you to have an MBA. There are certain roles that look for those, like, name brand MBA um, degrees and then there's certain roles that are like if you have an MBA okay box is checked if you have a master's okay box is checked if you have nothing but you kill your interview come on in so I say that's that's a really tough one I know for me I'm going to hold off on um, doing some sort of full-time uh, MBA program I feel like the networking I would gain from that I can probably work through with Google being kind of a name brand company um, 
And, and yeah, and basically, I think I'm going to probably hold off on that. That's maybe cool. do it if it sounds fun because <laughs> it does sound fun. No, I think that's great. I mean, I think. Um... Just because I went through an MBA process, a lot of the people on the show so far have that background as well. And I just really appreciate you as an example of someone who, who made a very big leap from the military and very successfully and, and challenged the assumption that something like an MBA is necessary. And I, I, I think it's great for people to make that decision based on what's right for them and not assume that it's necessary and not assume that that's the only path to a place like Google or wherever someone wants to go. And I, I just appreciate your response because I think it kind of weighs the pros and cons where a lot of people do go that path, but by no means is that essential or required. Exactly. I think that's a great point. Um, it's definitely an asset if you need it, but it's not a requirement. And actually, the reason I had these conversations with my manager is because I started getting nervous that I was missing that requirement. And, you know, after talking to him and kind of sharing what I just shared with you, I do feel like I'm okay. Like, I'm, I'm going to be all right. And if I want to do something in the future, you know, Google will either encourage me or, you know, my employer will either encourage, help pay for perhaps, or like at least give me the time to do some extended education, but at this particular juncture, like I'm in line with kids who went to Anderson, who went to Haas. So what would I really gain from doing that now? That's awesome. And um, it, it often seems like, um, you know, it, it's interesting because in your story, your last role in the Air Force kind of broke you through into Google. And, and, and my sense is that it's kind of like everyone's last job is kind of what's most looked at as credibility for your next opportunity. And so because, you know, my assumption is that because you're at Google now, it doesn't really matter as much. Like it's, if you're coming from a business school, it's just kind of like they'll look at your last, your last um, experience and you were amongst a bunch of MBAs. So it's kind of like irrelevant whether or not you've had that educational experience. So that's, um, right. I think it's just interesting to consider that it's not, I don't know, things, careers build on themselves and it's not like any one component is absolutely essential. Exactly. And, and you really have to consider with some of those programs, like if you're going to get maybe a $10,000 pay raise from me, how many years do you have to work that MBA offer to be worth it? And could my merit also help me progress, you know, through pay or through, uh, through the rank just as easily as yours, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it is a lot to consider, but I think it's definitely something you need to weigh the pros and cons with and not just say, okay, I got out, now it's time for an MBA. Or um, the other thing is there's, um, you know, like a PMT is uh, an option that companies like Google, they're always looking for project managers, always looking for program managers, and they love that PMT. Well, that's a little less intensive, obviously, than an MBA, but still a really nice, you know, three-letter acronym after your name. That's great. And for listeners, I'll put links to all these in the show notes. And I, I think that that's worth people looking into. That product management program is a, is a good, um, I like that as an alternative to an MBA. And, and would you say, is your, is your focus in a functional sense, is it more on operations or more on finance? Or is it like a blending between those two? Yeah, that's a great um, question. And it's actually really relevant to veterans. So I work in operations. I don't have uh, a CPA. I'm not an accountant, um, but yet I work in finance and I work deep in finance. But the biggest thing is, and what they look for in this role is process improvement, standardization, you know, standard operating procedures. Can you come in and find things that should be better and how can you make them better? And that's stuff we do in the military, in the military officers especially, all the time. We deploy and you pick up a process right where somebody left it off. So if that process isn't good, that handoff is really bad. And we do the same thing. I mentioned I have vendors in, um, in the Philippines and Krapa and Dublin. Well, as the sun rotates the earth, each of those teams has to pick up where the last one left off. And that's where I think the military is so viable and such a good source for people like that. We get it. We really get operations. And um, so the, the short answer to the question is, yes, I work in operations. <laughs> and... Um, and I really like it because it was not a hard transition for me from the military. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to agree. I mean, I think that veterans are well-suited for a 
very, very wide array of functional roles, but I think that operations appeals to a lot of us uh, who had that kind of get shit done mentality in the military and, and operations seems to be a lot about, you know, making sure the trains arrive on time and all the tactics and just the execution. And I think that that's often a, a, a forte and a well-developed muscle for veterans. That's a great point. Even, even on my last performance report, execution through the roof. I mean, no surprise there, right? But it was nice to kind of come in and have at least one of the many areas I was being graded on kind of already on lockdown. Because when you move from the military into corporate America, you, you have so much learning to do. And it's almost scary because you're like, oh, my God, everyone is so far ahead of me. You know, how am I going to catch up and learn everything that they know? But then you see that you're like, my leadership is on point. My execution is on point. I can learn the other stuff. And one thing I always like to ask about is um, habits from the military and I'm wondering, what are some of the positive habits that you had in the military that you've tried to maintain? But also, what are some of the habits that you've had to break in order to be successful at Google? Oh, that's such a great question. So some of the really helpful habits were, you know, being organized and kind of having that, like, type A mentality. Like, I work with a lot of salespeople. They're obviously very type A, and they'll come at me when, um, you know, something's not going their way. And, you know, I stand my ground. And I'm like, all right, let me, let, me, let me hear your side. You know, kind of that mediation. Um, even among coworkers, you're able to use your leadership skills to create, like, a really, really strong environment that um, is, is quite impressive to people who haven't had the formal leadership training and, of course, the practical leadership training that we've all had. Um, something that I definitely had to lose or become more flexible on is in the military, I feel like things are very often black and white. You look at your, we call them AFIs, Air Force Instructions in the Air Force, and it'll tell you his sideburns are or are not out of regs, or her shields are or are not out of regs, and it's pretty binary. But in Google especially, ambiguity is um, an area that you really have to be comfortable in. You know, some people come to work at 11 a.m. and leave at 8. Some people leave in the middle of the day and you can't get a hold of them. You have to just kind of be like, hey, it's okay. Like, we're going to get through this. Um, you know, the military, even with respect to like gender and relationships and fraternization, like we all know the rules, but when you come to Google, like you or, or any, you know, corporate company, you have to kind of understand like, okay, so if, um, the level five babysits for the director, that seems very strange to me, but you know what? It's okay. Or if, you know, this group of people all goes and gets a beer together, it's not weird anymore. <laughs> like, I can handle that. That's okay. You know, or people asking you, like, about your personal life. But, but, but being genuine about it, you don't have to be like, why are you asking? Why you want to know? You trying to get me in trouble? I don't do anything wrong. You know, you kind of got to just chill out and, and kind of be a little more flexible with some of the areas. Um, I mean, a perfect example of that is, um, I, I ran an offsite and we had roommates. All the people had roommates. And one of the, the folks was like, I'm gay and I don't want to room with a man. I'd rather room with a woman. And my initial gut reaction was like, no, you can't room with a woman. Like, that's going to cause a huge problem. Like, the military, military has made me think that that's impossible to happen successfully. And then I was like, okay, hold on. Calm down. Like, go find somebody who knows. I went to, like, our HR specialist and was like, hey, here's the scenario. And she kind of worked me through, like, hey, if he wants to room with a woman and they're both okay with it, that's okay. And I was like, okay, yeah, I guess it is okay. <laughs> so stuff like that is, um, is a little bit challenging to kind of not be so strapped. I guess. And I wasn't even that strapped in the military, but I come off like very, very strapped in the civilian world. So I'm working on like getting a little swagger and not being so (laughs) stoic all the time. (laughs) Oh man. I, I, I completely um, echo what you're saying on that too. And it's, it's, you know, even still um, I'm like nine or 10 years out now of the military and just realizing um, you know, the, the fraternization component is still kind of inbred where I have to remind myself that it's okay to hang out with people from work and that it's okay to socialize. And I think that there's still this ingrained sense of, of wrongness around that. Exactly. And I can just be really uptight on things that don't matter. And I think that that you know, that experience of being in life or death situations where doing 
um, doing things perfectly matters so much can bleed into our personal and professional lives in ways that it still surprises me it's there where it's like, oh, we can't be, you know, with, even with my wife, it's like, oh, we can't be late to this dinner party. And I'm like, then we're the first ones there and no one's on time. And it's like, right. okay, this is not that important, but it feels, it feels so vital. So that's, it's just interesting exactly. how those habits persist. I had a, one of my coworkers made a bet with uh, one of our directors over a football game. And I had to like hide the crazy because like in my heart, I was like, Oh my God, this is so bad. This is is such a bad perception. (laughs) And then the reality was like, no, it's not, you know, the bet is if one of them loses, they have to wear the other team's Jersey. Like that's okay. That creates a different type of camaraderie than what we're used to in the military or like a good culture where our director is a human. He's not just a colonel equivalent, like a, you know, crusty old director kind of thing. Um, but he's a, he's a cool guy and he, you know, he's going to get to know the people below him and make sense about a football game, you know, and that sort of stuff is, is like you said, it's a little tough, but at the same time, like I get it and I'm like, okay, this is okay. <laughs> and that, that leads into another question I was going to ask, which is how has leadership differed at Google versus in the military? I think when I was getting out of the military, I had this like puppy chest and I was like, you know what? There's a bunch of bad leaders in the military and I'm going to go work at Google where everybody is the best ever and it's just going to be such night and day. And then I went and worked for Google and I was like, man, there are bad managers, bad leaders everywhere. <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting uh, paradigm shift for me because I really put Google on a pedestal for like what their managers and what their leadership would be like. And at the end of the day, like, it's just different circumstances. They know how to lead people through different types of things than like what my leadership is. Uh, in the military, we lead a lot about people's personal lives. I remember as a flight commander, you know, I helped somebody buy a car or I helped somebody figure out if getting out of the military was the right thing for their family. Um, in the civilian sector, it's not often that the leaders are doing stuff like that, but they are like industry experts. You know, you go talk to them about a problem you're having, and they'll tell you seven solutions that you haven't even experienced yet. And so I think it's a very different leadership style um, and what constitutes a leader. The other thing I've noticed is um, most people, when they come out of the military and into a position like Google, if they haven't managed people at Google, they're likely not going to go into a people management role. And that was kind of an interesting pill to swallow for me because I'm like, man, I've had teams of 70, I've had teams of 12, I've been leading people since I was 22 years old kind of thing. And I came into my job at Google and they're basically like, okay, you're an individual contributor. Like, just make sure you don't mess up and make sure your manager is happy kind of thing. And um, the one thing I have noticed is like not to push my leadership onto other people. It's like, I have good ideas and I understand how to kind of manage people but I don't want to up manage that too much. I want to make sure that I'm only offering that when it's asked kind of thing, because otherwise you kind of come across as um, a little stuck up or like a know-it-all and people kind of get that opinion of like, you're new here or you're new to this industry. Like, what do you know about X, Y, and Z? And the reality is you're like, I know how to manage people. And guess what? These are a bunch of people but it kind of takes a second for you to kind of build that credibility to where somebody wants to hear your opinion. That's great. And um, what's been the most challenging aspect of working at Google? I think it's just been learning about how Google does business, Um, learning about who the competition is, what we're doing to stay innovative, um, and really understanding the product. Google has hundreds of products I've never heard of. You know, people say, what's your favorite Google product? The Gmail? I don't know. Google search? I don't know. Um, But the reality is, is like, there are so many different products. I work in finance, so we do a lot with, like, ads and ad serve. And there's, like, dozens of products in there that I would have never known existed. I didn't even know it existed when I worked at Google a year ago. And now I know, and now I work and specialize on them. (laughs) And I think that's been the hardest thing is, It's like reading and understanding how all these things fit together, how they are monetized, how they generate revenue. And then my job is to figure out, like, how can they generate more revenue or how can we cut our costs for this so that the revenue, you know, means more. And that sort of thing has been really, really challenging, especially coming from the military where, of course, we have budgets. But at the end of the day, it's like the warfighter needs something, the warfighter gets something. So there's not a lot of trade-offs that have to happen. 
But yeah, definitely learning the industry, really learning about a company. I mean, there's things about Google I could have told you nothing about um, until two months ago. And I think that's uh, that's been a challenge, but it's also been really cool. It's nice to kind of have that feeling of I come to work and I learn stuff and I enjoy doing it. Mm. Um, And I'm becoming a better worker and I'm becoming more marketable because now I'm having experiences that will make me valuable in the future. And, and that leads into another question I was going to ask, which is about career progression. And, and having been in operations at Google for a little while now, can, can you talk in general about a couple different career paths that you take, like maybe, um, you know, the next couple of years and how that would progress within Google and then paths that people pursue outside of Google and just kind of, um, sure. yeah. So the main thing is, um, and something that, I think is really, really cool is Google hires someone who is good for Google. They're not hiring someone who's going to be really good at their job. That is a secondary hire, of course, but they're looking for people who are good for Google because they encourage internal transfers. They encourage you to spend two, three, four years in one role and then, and then stretch into another role and spend two, three years in that role and get good at it and stretch into another role because then you're a huge asset for the company. You have depth and breadth. So when they hire, they're looking for somebody who's hopefully going to stay at Google and grow in their current position and future positions and really be an asset to the company. In my current role, I work in collections. So we do a lot of the, like collecting of money. And that's why I say what I do is really, really impacts like the bottom line, Google stock price, what shareholders look at. And I think that's super, super cool. But working in this area, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of sales folks. I also work with like other people in, in finance and those relationships. And, you know, me building credibility across those functions will be super helpful when in two, three, four years, I feel like I have really mastered my trade and I'm looking to kind of expand into other areas. It's not one of those companies or one of those roles that, you know, you're either going to stay at a captain equivalent forever, never promote, never leave, or you got to leave the company. Um, And that's been really, really cool. And then the other thing is, you know, not... Not to brag, but, uh, you know, having Google on my resume, I get phone calls and LinkedIn notes from all sorts of other companies being like, hey, are you willing to talk to this person? Are you willing to talk to that person? We're looking for somebody that, you know, fits your bill. And um, let's just say none of that was happening before I had Google on my resume. So I think there's tons of opportunity within the company that the company really um, focuses on, you know, another example is I can take classes that are outside of my trade. So I could take classes in computer programming or SQL and, um, and, and that's a Google offer class that is free. So I can expand my, my knowledge. I also can do like 20% in another area to help me kind of leapfrog into that area. Should I choose? Um, and then of course, just having the Google brand also makes you super marketable. So I feel like there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if someone is listening and this role of operations at Google sounds appealing, what are some signs that they might really like this sort of role and be well suited to it? But what are some also some signs that this might not be the right fit for them, either, either the company itself or uh, specifically the role in operations? The role in operations is good for somebody, operations in general, somebody who is process oriented. They're kind of a little more linear in their thinking. They're not coloring too far outside the box, but they will to, to make something better or to try or to innovate, right? Um, but with operations, it's a lot of, um, you could even call it like repetitive work. I mean, there's changes every day because of the clients that we work with. But at the end of the day, like every month, we go through the same types of processes, right? And so if you're looking for something that is, maybe that's what you hated about the military, right? And then a job in operations might not be the right place for you. And you might want to try something where, you know, you can be a little bit more of a free thinker or an entrepreneur. In operations, it's, it's encouraged, but you don't want to be a bull in a china shop. There's a reason these processes are in place and there's a reason they work well. I think, yeah, I think that person who does operations is somebody who maybe works logistics or kind of has a set of procedures and they notice, you know, that's really inefficient. We should change that. <laughs> that type of person or the person who, when they walk to their car, they're thinking, how can I be most optimal in this walk back to my car? (laughs) 
Um, but stuff like that. I think that's the type of person that really succeeds in operation just because they're always thinking of how to make it better um, without really, you know, flipping a process on its head, unless, of course, it needs to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. And um, looking back at your transition from the Air Force to civilian life, what was one of the biggest surprises? What was something that you didn't know to expect about what life would be like outside of the military? Oh, that's the easiest question of today. The answer is taxes. I had no idea what it was like to have a paycheck fully taxed. And that was really, really eye-opening and scary. And I was, I don't know how to explain it. When I would look at my paycheck, I would be like, where did all of my money go? Um, and especially living in California, it's even worse. Um, but I would say this is my piece of advice for surprises is you're going to get offered a salary and it's going to be higher than what you had in the military, but it is fully taxable. There is no BAH. There is no free health care. Like I, I really challenge people to take whatever offer you get, find that calculator online, figure out what the net of the net of the net is and say, can I live off of this in the area they want me to work? You know, because $80,000 in Mississippi is different than $80,000 in Northern California. Um, and, you know, look at the BAH calculator for your area and just to give you a feel of like, how much would the military give me if I lived here? Okay, I should probably keep that much of my paycheck aside to be able to live here. And if that ends up being 60% of your paycheck, like, yikes, it might be the perfect job, but you don't want to, you don't want to leave the military where, you know, you're, you're making ends meet, you're saving good money, you're doing good things, you're getting these bonuses, et cetera, et cetera, to go into the civilian world and all of a sudden be back to, like, starving lieutenant status or starving college kid because, you know, $100,000 wasn't actually that much money when the dust settled and my rent in the Bay Area is $2,800 a month and that's a full paycheck. What am I supposed to do now? Um, so that would be, I guess, my biggest thing for transitioning is really – Make sure not to get jaded by the six-figure salary or the, you know, the upper two figures or whatever it is, and make sure that when the dust settles, you know, you can provide for yourself, you can pay your rent, you can, you know, work through any debt you have that your family is going to be taken care of, or you know, that you haven't figured out beforehand. And so there's there's no surprises on that front because there'll be enough surprises working through learning your job and you know practicing being kind of starting all over. Um, at the bottom of the totem pole, kind of working your credibility up. Nobody knows who you are, um, that you can really focus on. Money should not be the thing that is stressing you out on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, I think that's such great advice, and I think that's something that not a lot of people know to expect and that they're um, they're approaching this through a simplistic lens of a single number to define what they're going to do out of the military. And, and then not only does that not account for your job satisfaction, fulfillment and happiness, but it's also misleading and that there's a lot that they haven't had to pay for in the military that they will on the outside. And so it's not a direct comparison. Exactly. Uh, I mean, like co-pays and cost shares, all that stuff is, is, is definitely crazy. If, if you could go back in time to yourself right before you transitioned out of the air force, What's what's one piece of advice that you would give to yourself at that time? Uh, my biggest piece of advice would be to have a plan. Um, the, the military is such a good thing. It takes such good care of us. And we put our blood, sweat, and tears into it. Um, and it's a good relationship for most people. You don't want to run from the military to something else. I think that that would set you up for failure. You might get two years out of the military and be like, what have I done? I want to be back. I miss the people. I miss the job. I miss the, you know, financial security. I miss all the stuff. I miss the points. Make sure that when you, you transfer, you have a plan and you're, you're taking a step forward into your life. You're not taking a lateral step or a step backwards. Do what you can. Get your ducks in a row. You know, figure out what you need to be successful and then take that step forward. Um, so my advice to myself would be to just you know, have a plan. If you're planning on getting out, don't take a job like a special project officer that's not going to have a lot of benefits for you as a civilian. You know, decline that job politely and stay in an area that's going to help you take that step forward in your career. That's awesome. That's, I think that's such great advice. And um, 
One of the last questions I have is just around resources. So for particularly for someone who's on active duty or maybe a recently transitioned, is there any resource that you would recommend? It could be a book, a website, podcast, video, just anything that might help them um, in that transition process or learning about what they might do or just anything that might help them professionally? I think that going to um, career conferences, whether it be the service academy ones or, um, like I mentioned, the nuclear power one that I went to, I think that that is a good barometer test for where you are. You can see the types of companies. You can see what they're they're, they're looking for. Uh, You know, the first time you go, maybe you just walk around. You know, see what people are saying, see what they're, what they're advertising, and then you kind of get back to the drawing board and say, man, i got to change my resume. I want to be competitive for this job. Like, this particular area has a lot of positions open, and that's what I really want to focus on. And then, like I mentioned, that PCS to Corporate America book was priceless for me. I literally bought a notebook, and I wrote down every single interview question, and I formulated answers to it. And I practiced and practiced and practiced. And when I finally got to my interviews, the questions, of course, weren't exactly the same. But I was able to pick off of these, like, the practice questions I had to really formulate a response that I was proud of. Like, when I left my Google interview, I was like, if I don't get this job, I'm okay with that because I really feel like I did my best. I didn't feel like, man, I should have practiced this or I should have done this better. I really answered that question poorly. You know, I felt like I really, I did my due diligence practicing. I worked through that book, you know, saw a lot of the questions that the book had in my actual interviews, which was perfect. It felt like I was studying for the test out of the answers too, so that was awesome. And then, you know, just I guess the last thing is, is I always thought I was a good interviewer. Every position I had interviewed in for the Air Force, I got. So I was like, I'm, I'm good at this. It's easy. And then when I really started to practice, I was like, oh man, I am so bad at this. I, I make the joke that I black out. I black out. I have no idea what I talked about for 10 minutes. What, where am I? What did I do? What did I say? Was it good? I don't know. And when I really worked through that book and took advantage of some of these career conferences to talk to people and kind of practice what I had been practicing, I think it made me a significantly better interviewer. It also made me realize how poor I was at first (laughs) and, and helped me kind of grow in that respect so that when I actually started looking for jobs, the interview, I wasn't stressing about how I was going to answer questions. I was stressing about how am I going to show this person that I have what they need? You know, how am I going to show this person that, the three things they're looking for, I got them plus five. And I want to make sure that they leave that interview saying, man, this is the person I want to hire. And I think that it's just practice, practice, practice. Even if you think you're a good interviewer in the military, like practice interviewing with people who don't speak your language. Have that, they say like, interview with your mom because your mom's going to be like, oh, Billy, I don't know. I, what, is, what was that acronym? Like, what does that mean? I don't even know. Is that, is that military? And you're going to be like, oh, mom, you're so dumb. But the reality is, is that's the civilian world. They don't understand acronyms. Like when you say Intel, right, nobody in Silicon Valley thinks you're talking about intelligence. They think you're talking about the Intel Pentium processor. <laughs> so just keep stuff like that in mind. That's awesome. Well, I always like to reserve the last um, space just to turn things over to you. And I I know we've covered a lot of questions I had, but I'm just wondering if there's any final words of wisdom about personal life or professional life that you'd want to um, pass on to those veterans listening. Yeah, um, I think that getting out of the military, like I said, it wasn't my choice, but it was definitely a good choice for me. I, I love being a civilian. I, I still dress crappy and don't do my hair, but that's not my, that's not anything else fun but my own. <laughs> um, but uh, it, I wish I, like, I almost wish I would have done it sooner. I really had some great opportunities in the military. And now that I'm like a civilian, I, I just think of, man, if only I had started this sooner. So for people who are kind of on the cusp, if you have a plan and you're just nervous, you know, go for it. Take that next step get your plan and just go forward and, and, you know, failure is not an option. If um, if you love what you're doing in the military, keep doing it and just keep your ears and eyes open for other opportunities. Um, But I would say for me personally, it's been, it's had its trials and tribulations, but it's been a really, really positive experience. And, um, and then the other thing is regardless of where you are in your career, whatever you're doing, pay it forward. There's always someone who can learn from your experiences. I personally try to help everyone who reaches out to me on LinkedIn, 
if they're in the military, especially, you know, help them understand what's out there, understand, like I said, the interview process and how the, how the wickets work and, and all that stuff. Like anything that you've ever struggled with, someone else will struggle with too. So, you know, do your service and no matter what route you take, there'll be somebody to help you and you just make sure you help somebody else later. Well, Ashley, I appreciate your paying it forward to the Beyond the Uniform community with this interview and a lot of great advice you've given. So thank you for joining me. Yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Surface, surface, surface. Thanks for listening. Before you go, three important announcements. First, if you believe in what I'm doing and believe in supporting veterans in their careers, please, please, please help me spread the word. The best way I know to do that right now is by taking 18 seconds to write a review on iTunes. It would mean a lot. Second, based on my interviews, I'd advise any and all veterans to look at servicetoschool.org and the American Corporate Partners. Both are completely free for veterans and give you a lot of great resources for your education or professional life, respectively. Third, there are a ton of other great interviews, resources, and data at beyondtheuniform.io. Check it out, share it with your friends, and drop me a line if you have any feedback because I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, and see you on the next interview.